So for those of you who I don't know, I'm Marty Guggenheim and Hayes Fellow from 1971. <clears throat> and I have occasionally stepped in as an acting director of this program. And I'm pleased to be doing it again now. Um, I have taught here since um, for 46 years. Um, and all that time, Norman Dorson and Sylvia Law were my colleagues. And contemplating being here without Norman, it, 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 absorbing that and, and living through that has, has been a huge challenge. But the loss of Sylvia, in addition, is, is, leaves me breathless. Um, they were always there for me in ways that um, made it possible to get through tough weeks. And um, the thought that Sylvia won't be there starting soon is um, very, very sad. Um, so we, this community, have this amazing thing that we carry with us. Um, we feel special because we are part of a group of extraordinary people, even if none of us is, a lot of us are somehow. And um, among them, uh, at least for me, uh, one of my great heroes, uh, and I asked uh, Helen for the privilege to introduce David Rudofsky. 52 years ago, David became a fellow in the Hayes program, wisely chosen by Norman only about five or six years after Norman began teaching here. Um, and, um, the only two MacArthur geniuses among us, unless I'm wrong, happened to be Sylvia and David. Um, David left New York and went to Philadelphia and became the leading civil rights litigator in the city. Um, everybody knows Rudofsky. Uh, Rudofsky does everything. Um, <laughs> criminal defense, civil rights, uh, police brutality, um, First Amendment. He teaches at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, not full-time because he believes being a civil rights lawyer is a higher calling. Um, and I just, it's my great privilege to, to introduce David, who's going to uh, convene this panel. Marty, thanks. Thanks so much. And Helen and, and Sylvia, um, when uh, Sylvia emailed me and called me and uh, asked whether I would uh, chair one of these panels, first of all, would I come? Of course, how could I not have been coming to these events for uh, since those 52 years? Um, although the prospect of coming this year without uh, Norman was, was, was quite sobering in a lot of ways. And I, I said, uh, absolutely. Um, um, you know, Norm, uh, 1967, I was a, a fellow. Uh, uh, Bob Van Lierup, uh, uh, fellow fellow <laughs> in that year. Um, Ron Pollock the next year. Uh, Sylvia the next year. A lot of people in this room who I, I work with and knew. And, you know, I've had the benefit over the years um, uh, uh, of practice and, and teaching of working with some enormously capable people, um, uh, 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 both, both lawyers and, uh, uh, and, and colleagues in the profession and, uh, and political activists and community organizers and stuff. But there's something about the Hayes program that, and what's been produced here, which really is pretty special when you look at what people have done and have continued to do. It wasn't just a couple of years as a, uh, a year as a fellow and then we'd go out for a couple of years and do some civil liberties work. Uh, people, by and large, have really stuck with their commitment. So it's, uh, uh, it really is a great honor to be back and, 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 and a wonderful panel, I think, that we have. Uh, on the other hand, Sylvia said, uh, well, what we're going to talk about is protecting and expanding rights. And I sat there and said, well, what? <laughs> uh, I mean, protecting maybe, um, resistance maybe, um, 
preserving maybe partially of what we have, although we've already lost a lot, and who knows what, how much more we can lose, but really expansion? Is that what we're going to, is that what the challenge may be? And, and yet there was, there, was, there was a glimmer of, of, of more than just the hope there. I think there are some p opportunities. We've seen it from the last panel where there's some opportunities for progress, not just preserving uh, what, what we may have. Um, and it reminded me when, 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 you know, when I was here in 67, the height of the Warren Court, right? I mean, you know, it's, uh, I just remember, you know, a couple of years working with Norman of, you know, writing a cert petition. It's granted, you argue it, you win. Um, uh, it wasn't every case, you know, there were, there were some losses, but, you know, there was the, uh, the so-called illegitimacy cases, right, that, that we worked on. Right? Illegitimacy, the rights of the illegitimate, right? Uh, think about arcane language. Um, uh, it's like, like the rights of illegal aliens, right? You know, it's like they came from Mars. Um, uh, and, you know, and Galt and, and, and so on. And Norman, you know, and, and we said, well, you know, it's going to continue. We all thought 1968, year of the revolution, we're going to really change this world, even as lawyers. And Norman said, uh, I remember saying two things at one point. He said, um, we, don't, we don't always have this court. Um, <laughs> Well, he's right, but I thought 50 years without that court, and we're going darker into the forest, you know, it's uh, getting worse and worse. Um, and if there's a revolution in this country, it's probably not going to come from the left. Um, uh, and so kind of, you know, some perception about uh, the character of this country and, 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 and what we face. Um, uh, so, the, so that is the issue. You know, what, what do we do in the era of, of, of Trump and Kavanaugh and McConnell? Um, and the power, uh, at least politically speaking, you know, almost all on the federal level at this point, we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks, um, on, on the far right, it's not just the right, it's, it's, it's the far right. Um, uh, what do we do as lawyers? Uh, how do we think about uh, uh, preserving what we've done, litigation, uh, whether it's case by case, uh, what does it mean about impact litigation? Uh, but where do we also think there may be opportunities for, uh, for change? As much as we see contradictions in our own work, I and mean, we talked about it all day long, you know, race and, uh, and equality and First Amendment, and you know, you think about criminal justice and sexual assaults and due process and all those issues that we, uh, that even internally, right, we don't agree on, 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 on everything, um, uh, to be sure there are equal contradictions on the right um, uh, that, 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 that we ought to recognize uh, uh, and exploit, and we'll, we'll discuss some of that uh, uh, today. But it really is a question about creating um, new models, uh, creating new narratives, um, and people in this room um, have been doing it, people on the panel have been doing it, have been thinking about different ways, and different coalitions. Uh, it's not always a right-left issue. A lot of criminal justice issues these days, it's not so much a right-left argument. Um, uh, on some issues they are, uh, and some issues uh, they're not. Um, and so the question is, how do we uh, look at those issues, how do we think about them, um, as lawyers, and, and, and how do we kind of move ahead on that, on that process. So we've got four um, quite remarkable uh, Hayes uh, uh, fellows here. We're going to be talking about First Amendment, criminal justice, immigration, and reproductive rights. A little different format from the first panel. Um, we've decided that each panelist will talk first for about 10 minutes. We'll have a short discussion about what that panelist has talked about. Um, uh, and at the end, we'll try to have a more general conversation about trying to link uh, some of these issues together. So we're going to start first uh, with the First Amendment. Um, and our speaker um, from Hayes 2009, right? Um, okay. Um, uh, Lizzie Seidlin Bernstein uh, is currently of counsel in the media and entertainment group of Ballard Spar in Philadelphia. Um, her practice focuses on representing media clients and First Amendment and other content-related matters, including defending news organizations in defamation and privacy litigation and providing pre-publication and pre-broadcast advice. Uh, in a world where journalists are the enemy, um, uh, you've got your hands full. It'd be interesting to see what you're thinking about these issues. Thanks for that introduction. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so also thank you to Helen and Sylvia for the invitation. Um, I am not here to solve the problem of hate speech and uh, tensions with our First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, I'm also not here to be a spokesperson for the weaponized First Amendment, as Justice Kagan so memorably called it. Um, I think I'm gonna be talking about something where we have a lot more common ground. Um, I operate in a pretty small sliver of the First Amendment, uh, which is media law, and um, 
focusing on press freedom. So I'm gonna talk about that today and I think that press freedom is important to the work that all of you in this room do. Um, I think it is fair to say that we have never had a president uh, who is so openly hostile to press freedom. He, or excuse me, press freedom and also just the press generally. Uh, he <clears throat> is constantly referring to fake news. Um, that is uh, a, a, a constant refrain. And he is um, labeling journalists and news organizations with epithets like disgusting, dishonest, scum, lying, failing. Um, He's even called the press the enemy of the American people, which is the kind of language that we usually associate with uh, authoritarian rulers. And I, I do think that this rhetoric has had an effect on the culture. Obviously, uh, as I said, fake news has become part of the lexicon. Um, there's also a real sense of physical threat to journalists. Um, I don't know that it's uh, unique to this time, but there was not only this bomb that was mailed to CNN this last week, um, in addition to others. Um, thankfully, no one was hurt in that instance. But earlier this year, in Annapolis, there was a newsroom that had a mass shooting, and tragically, five newsroom employees were killed in that. Um, I'm not one usually for polls, but I thought this one was interesting. Um, according to Gallup polling, public trust in the media hit an all-time low in 2016. And uh, at that point, 32% of Americans said that they had a great deal or fair amount of trust in the media. Uh, it's been actually creeping back up a bit since then. So in 2018, when they last did this round of polling, it was 45%. I'm not gonna say that's good news. Um, that's still not a very uh, high percentage, but it's an improvement. And I, I would like to think as a media lawyer that um, perhaps the current political situation has reminded people of the importance of um, a free press to our democracy. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir, but of course, uh, the reason the free press is so important is that we can't know what our government's up to, we can't make change unless we have journalists out there, or it could be even um, organizations or individuals working in the same kind of capacity as journalists uh, to investigate it and tell us about it. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is just identify a couple of challenges, sort of general types of challenges to press freedom in the Trump era, and then um, discuss the degree to which I'm concerned about them as a media lawyer. The first one is uh, Trump's repeated threats to open up the libel laws or somehow uh, weaken the libel laws protections for the press. What he means is, um, that he wants to make it easier for plaintiffs to succeed in defamation suits. And really, every few months, you hear some kind of language to this effect from Trump when he's not happy about um, the latest round of reporting. Um, he especially wants to make it easier for public officials and public figures like him to sue in defamation. Um, and he himself has been an unsuccessful defamation plaintiff in the past and often threatens news organizations like the New York Times for, uh, with defamation suits. Um, this is actually one area of, uh, of the law that Trump really doesn't have a whole lot of formal power to affect. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, first, defamation's a state law tort. Uh, it's, there's no federal cause of action and uh, second, much of what Trump's complaining about is actually constitutional protections. Uh, so for example, he's um, not a fan of the actual malice standard uh, of fault that um, public officials and public figures uh, have to meet when they're plaintiffs that says that a plaintiff has to show knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth um, by clear and convincing evidence in a defamation suit. This makes it very, very hard for public official, public figure plaintiffs to win defamation suits. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, this is not the kind of thing that you can just change through uh, legislation or executive order. The problem, I should say, for Trump, not for us. Um, <laughs> the origin of all of these uh, protections is the Supreme Court, going back to New York Times versus Sullivan in um, the early 70s, or excuse me, in the 60s. and. Um, it's, it's not so easy to weaken the libel laws. 
uh, libel, libel protections. Um, obviously, this could be accomplished through judicial appointments. Uh, that's a long game. I actually don't think that that is um, a particular fixation of Trump when it comes to his judicial appointments so far. Um, and it's actually really difficult to predict how the current Supreme Court would rule in uh, media cases because the Supreme Court has not decided a media case since 2001. Um, and only three of those justices from that case are remaining on the court and they all went in different directions. Um, so, so far, Trump really doesn't have a lot to show for his threats to open up libel laws. Um, it's just kind of part of his general negative rhetoric about the press. Um, at most, I would say that there's been an anecdotal uptick in public official, public figure defamation suits or threats of suit. We just um, saw that um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio uh, has filed a massive $150 million lawsuit. Um, these kinds of splashy demands, I think, are becoming more common. Um, but really, this is not a thing that has been keeping me up at night, um, having seen how it's unfolded. Um, the, the thing that's actually much more troubling and I think really gets to the institutional threat that this presidency has posed um, and probably ties in a little more with the work that others are doing is what we've seen in, the, um, in terms of overt viewpoint discrimination um, that comes in the form of retaliation against news organizations or journalists for the content of their reporting. Um, and there's really, there's been a lot of different ways that this has manifested, but one would be barring or threatening to bar news organizations or reporters from press events, um, revoking their press credentials. Another is threatening to revoke broadcasters, um, FCC licenses. Um, to my knowledge, that has not actually been followed through with yet, but it's, it's been a threat that's been made by the president directly. Um, he has also threatened to raise Amazon's postal rates um, because its CEO, Jeff Bezos, is also owner of the Washington Post. Um, after making these threats, uh, the president actually issued an executive order directing the Postal Service to review its rates. Um, there's reporting that he personally asked the postmaster to uh, increase postal rates for Amazon. Um, and then just this month, the Postal Service did in fact raise postal rates. Uh, of course, he denies that this is aimed at Amazon. Um, another example of this sort of selective enforcement is threatening to block the merger between uh, CNN's parent company, Time Warner, and AT&T because of CNN's reporting, which the president is also not a big fan of. Um, after those types of threats, DO DOJ did in fact file a lawsuit to block the merger. Uh, it was unsuccessful. That case is now on appeal to the DC Circuit. And the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press has filed an amicus brief that um, makes a really compelling case that this is a matter of selective enforcement. Um, for the most part, news organizations have basically, I think, made the calculation that they don't want to be going and suing the administration um, when they could be out reporting and um, it may not be in their interest to do so. Um, but we have started to see some of this action, like the Reporters Committee's work. Um, there's also a new lawsuit that was just filed by um, the Pan American Center that lays out these types of viewpoint discrimination um, against news organizations, and um, it's seeking declaratory and injunctive relief um, for violation of the First Amendment. Um, I think their first challenge is probably going to be uh, as a matter of standing, but it's they have some good arguments there, and I'll, I'll be very interested to see how it unfolds. There would certainly be some very interesting discovery um, should it be allowed to go forward. Um, but I guess. What I want to say here is what's really vexing about this type of um, selective enforcement is that there may be a perfectly reasonable policy justification for government action. I am not a, an antitrust lawyer. I have um, no opinion as a lawyer about whether the uh, AT&T Time Warner merger should have gone through. Um, but it is very disturbing to think that the president would be taking enforcement action because of hostility to the press based on the content that it's putting out. Um, and there is real evidence of that. I'm, again, I'm not an antitrust lawyer, but I understand that um, 
this was a vertical merger of the sort that is usually um, has not been challenged by the federal government since the 70s. And um, this was the first time. And of course, they, the merger was um, actually successful and it's on appeal. But um, I, I think that the, the motivation of animus um, is something that courts really need to be willing to look at because um, we saw this certainly in the travel ban litigation. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, areas where this type of selective enforcement could be uh, abused. Um, so I, we're going to see how these litigations unfold. Um, the good news is that when it comes to press freedom, I think at the moment uh, we still have, the sky is not fallen. We still have really excellent reporting coming out every day. Um, if anything, the press is galvanized, maybe more willing to call it like it is um, when it comes to um, uh, our, our president's outright lies. And um, I am encouraged by that. So my goal is just to um, do my best to keep it that way. Okay. Thank you. So we can spend maybe five minutes some questions as hey, we'll, we'll come back again at the, at the end with some questions. Uh, and, and let me just Liz, I, I, start with this one. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting on the First Amendment, it's one of those issues where in some ways the left and the right agree robust uh, uh, First Amendment protections. In fact, the uh, conservatives have used that, you use the term weaponizing, right? So whether it's campaign finance or uh, First Amendment rights to weaken labor unions and so on, uh, all using kind of broad, robust First Amendment doctrine. Uh, uh, how do uh, media lawyers think about that, uh, if at all, right, in, in terms of, you're, you're obviously asking for expansive press freedoms. Um, and can we live in a world um, that has very broad First Amendment rights for the organized press, social media, and so on, um, and somehow uh, differentiate that? from other areas. I know it wasn't the main part of your talk, but it, yeah. it seems to me that First Amendment is, is such a kind of complicated area that way. Um, um, and, 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 you know, Steve obviously sp uh, spoke about it to some degree. Um, but like in, in, in your practice in representing uh, newspapers and, uh, and media outlets, um, uh, or is it just, you know, that's our role there and we can't be worried about the broader implications? Well, I mean, it's a tough question because I think in the day to day, it's easy to not take all of these things into account. And as I said before, I, I do think that there's, um, generally speaking, not, I, I would love to have people correct me if they disagree um, and we can have that discussion, but I, I don't think that having robust press is in tension with um, general uh, support for social justice and equality. Um, but it's when you have this sort of First Amendment creep. Um, and it's not even to say, I mean, I think that there are real um, complications when it comes to uh, the use of the First Amendment in other areas that I have not fully thought, thought through. Um, I don't have to in my day-to-day -day work, but I want to acknowledge that um, I may have a more complicated view of things like Citizens United than others in this room, partly because um, I think one of the things that really shocked people about Citizens United was that um, it seemed to be announcing that corporations have First Amendment rights. Uh, I sure hope they do, because if they don't, then uh, the New York Times gets sued. It has no rights. Their journalist would have the rights. Well, the journalists are not the ones with the deep pockets, and um, certainly having uh, no rights, no First Amendment rights for corporate entities that are news organizations is going to um, chill speech. So um, I, I do not have the answers, um, but I acknowledge the tensions. And, um, and it, I, I do think it, as just as a personal, I mean, I'm representing, I'm in private practice representing news organizations of all kinds that have different views on these things. But um, I personally, as a lawyer, do think about that every representation that I have. Um, what the implications might be beyond what we're doing for them in this one case. Okay. Questions? Question there? Please, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess like, oh, I'm Gerardo. I'm a current Hayes Fellow. Um, so I guess I'm just thinking about like uh, uh, politically unpopular, marginalized groups on distrust of the media. Um, so thinking of like, um, 
you know, when Israel attacks Palestinians, Palestinians are, you know, uh, written in a certain way by the New York Times. Every time a trans person is murdered, their dead name shows up. Every time a black person is murdered by the police, their criminal history shows up. Like, there's like a, a huge mistrust of like liberal media because of, you know, the way they reinforce power structures, um, particularly because of the lack of diversity in these spaces. Um, so I guess I'm wondering from your perspective if you have any ideas of like how politically unpopular marginalized groups can hold uh, mainstream media accountable um, to like how they reinforce hierarchy in this country? Uh, it's a big question, and I do not uh, know that I can answer it while um, being, I mean, I have an interest in the institutional press as well as every other kind of uh, news organization that I would represent, which includes, I mean, it's, it's certainly not all um, the mainstream media, quote unquote. Um, and I, I think that um, you have to think about press freedom as extending beyond just um, your New York, New York Times of the world. But um, I would say that uh, I am very much in favor of, um, I guess, well, this is again wearing my personal hat. Um, newsrooms doing, taking some steps. I know um, I saw, I was very interested, cleveland.com just um, announced that they're going to be um, they already had started not uh, using mugshots automatically, and they're now taking into account um, if people come to them and say, um, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but basically, if, you know, I've had my criminal record expunged. Um, I no longer want this on the website anymore. Um, that sort of voluntary conduct, I think, is a very valid choice for a newsroom to make. I have a lot of concerns about complete erasure of the historical record, but I do think the internet complicates things, um, and so. Um, I'm a First Amendment lawyer. I don't want these things to be, um, I, I don't want the government to be the one deciding what stuff can be um, kept on the internet or not. And I think that that's important, especially because as uh, Steve Shapiro said earlier, do we really want this government, um, I mean, this should be our good example, being the one making those decisions about the content. But no, I mean, it's, it's a big issue, and I, I don't know in terms of the sort of practical, you know, how do you get people, how do you get more diversity in newsrooms and that kind of thing. Um, that's very much for the practitioners of journalism, and I'm, I'm just their lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> think, let's take one more question on this, and then we'll move on to the next subject matter area. Hi there, thank you for uh very interesting presentation. And my name is Steve Polin. I was a Hayes Fellow back in the uh, 20th century. We'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> it's obvious one of uh, Trump's motivations for what he's doing in terms of the attacks is to, uh, from his perspective, to create a chilling effect on the media and the press. And I'm wondering, from your practice representing clients, none of whom you're going to disclose or talk about any particular clients, whether you think he's actually having that effect in terms of the real world observations that you're seeing coming across your desk every day? Um, I think that probably the biggest effect is not so, I mean, I, honestly, journalists are not shy people and they're not gonna be cowed by, um, you know, the people who are doing the reporting on the administration um, are not going to, it'll make them defiant, not um, uh, chilled. But, well, right, I mean, I think that that's the issue. Um, part of it is that there is a lot of pressure on these um, companies that own the news organizations. And I actually don't know that I have the um, insight into that uh, because that would involve stories being killed with, before they ever got to me as a lawyer vetting them. Um, <clears throat> but I also, um, I would say that in there is more of a, an urge to um, avoid litigation because there is such a, a Trump effect on juries and um, judges even, uh, where people are, I mean, juries have never liked the press, um, but uh, now fake news can be kind of a catchphrase that you use in a jury trial in a press case, and um, it's very effective uh, depending on the jurisdiction, and so um, I think it has caused news organizations to think more about settling when they would have valid claims or valid defenses. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, okay, um, Adam Murphy was a Hayes Fellow a long time ago, 2017. Um, 
now a lawyer with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, EJI is one of the, if not the most foremost, uh, uh, criminal justice reform agencies in the, uh, in the country doing spectacular work on death penalty and prison conditions and solitary and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so he, there representing men and women on death row, uh, who've been sentenced to life in prison without parole in, in a state um, uh, uh, in which it's as uh, serious as it can be, Alabama, uh, without much resources, um, and a court system that's turning quite negative to uh, uh, habeas petitions and capital cases. So, uh, Aaron, <laughs> a year out, your observations? <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I have to say I feel a little uh, ill-equipped, as David referenced, to talk about such a big topic, given that I didn't know what a tort was four years ago. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to take the lessons that I learned as a Hayes Fellow and from my year at EJI um, and impart them here. So um, as we sit here, there are 2 million people in local jails and state prisons and 200,000 people in federal custody. Given these numbers, it is not surprising that the center of gravity for criminal justice reform is local. And so even in the age of Trump and even with the conservative Supreme Court, there is significant opportunity for reform. There's important and exciting work being done to not only drive down prison populations, but to also confront the narratives about the people that we punish and disfavor. Working to change the narrative about criminality and understanding its racial and historical roots is the single most important thing that we could do as lawyers in this space in any era. If we don't change the narrative, there is a ceiling on how much reform we could have, no matter how brilliant our legal arguments are, no matter how correct we are in precedent, or principle, as we've seen in other contexts, it's the narrative change that precipitates the legal change. And so with this in mind, I want to talk about three possible avenues for reform. The first is litigation efforts that target state Supreme Courts rather than the United States Supreme Court. The second is creative projects that operate outside of the litigation sphere. And in the third, and in my view the most important, is working to change narratives about people that we punish and disfavor that allows them to be punished and disfavored in that way. So just the current Supreme Court at this moment cannot be expected to advance reform. This court in the criminal justice space is obviously is, is arguably more conservative than the court that held that pretextual traffic stops are constitutional, more conservative than the court that held that the Eighth Amendment doesn't ban life without parole sentences for people convicted of possession of cocaine, and more conservative even than the Supreme Court that said that racial discrimination in the administration of the death penalty is inevitable. You know you're on tenuous ground when Justice Roberts is a swing vote, and so litigating at the Supreme Court right now could actually create decades of bad law. So it's a first avenue reform. If you still want to litigate, you could target certain Supreme Courts. And as a first step, you could look at a variety of indices to see what court might be best. And a way to do this is to look at the politicization of the courts. Are the court, uh, are judge, judges of those courts um, elected or are they appointed? Um, how have the individual justices talked or written about legal issues outside of court? And of course, how they've engaged with the law in the area that you want to advance. And the Iowa Supreme Court and juvenile sentencing is actually a very helpful case study. In Iowa, justices are elected for an eight-year term, and they are largely immune from majoritarian sentiment. Uh, the, uh, at the, at the last few state of the judiciary addresses in Iowa, the uh, justices have said all children are children and should not be subjected to the most harsh adult punishments. And the Iowa Supreme Court has actually ex explicitly extended the holdings in Graham and Miller and they now prohibit uh, life without parole sentences for all children. And so when you work in these spaces, when you extend the law in these spaces, you're not only helping dozens of children within the individual state, you are setting the framework, you are creating a world in which the, a more progressive United States Supreme Court have data points when evaluating evolving standards of decency under the Eighth Amendment. But litigation is, is probably not gonna get us where we wanna go alone. And so I wanna spend a few minutes talking about two projects that I was able to work at in law school. One is a Hayes Fellow, uh, the first in the bail context and the second in the parole context. So in New York City, as recently as 2016, there were 50,000 people held pretrial annually simply because they couldn't afford bail. Of those 50,000 people, 10,000 were held in on bail amounts less than $1,000, and hundreds of people were held in on bail amounts of $250 and $500. The pervasive narrative at the time was that unless you had a financial incentive to return, you were not gonna to return to court, and so that's how cash bail was justified. There were a number of litigation efforts spearheaded by the Bronx defenders, 
and organizations became authorized to post bail for people charged with misdemeanor offenses who had bail amounts set at $2,000 or less. And so bail funds sprung up in Bronx and in Brooklyn, but when I was in law school, there was no bail fund here in Manhattan. And so a number of students at NYU and faculty members, we started our own bail fund. And we ended up posting bail for people who were um, charged with stealing baby diapers from CVS, people who hopped subway turnstiles, people arrested for trespassing on their own roofs in public housing. And our posting bail for them not only allowed them to go home, but fight their case in a meaningful way, to not be coerced into pleading guilty. And as a result, 70% of the people we posted bail for were, had their cases resolved in non-criminal dispositions or outright dismissals. Not a single person we posted bail for spent a sing, uh, any more time in jail. Um, but I think more importantly than that, what we were able to demonstrate is that 90% of the, 95% actually, 95% of the people we posted bail for came back for every single one of their court appearances. And that data was true for the other bail funds as well. And so that started to change the consciousness about what it is that makes people come back to court. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't a personal financial incentive, but rather a simple reminder phone call or having the resources and the infrastructure or a metro card will get you back to court. And as we've seen, it's, it's been a little bit of a slow process, but we've started to see, because of this consciousness, a move away from cash bail. The second thing I want to talk about is a project I did as a Hayes Fellow in the parole context. As recently as 2017, the rate of parole release in New York State plummeted to 18%. For certain crimes, the rate of release fell to the single digits. There were organizations that were doing wonderful work representing people in an individual capacity at the parole board, bringing more systemic legal challenges, but no matter how good their arguments were, the release rate continued to drop. And so a group of parole advocates took a step back and said, what, what is going on here? What could we possibly do to change things? And what was identified was that five of the 12 parole commissioners, a significant disproportionate amount, had been appointed and were layovers of Governor Pataki's appointments. And um, if, you, if you went in front of one of those commissioners, you essentially were not getting paroled. And so we wanted to see if we could make a credible claim that said that, the, that, um, that they should not be reappointed. And so we collected hundreds of transcripts for, fi for those five commissioners. And I was tasked as a Hayes Fellow with trying to get Commissioner James Ferguson off of the board, who was at least procedurally the most offensive. He would belittle applicants. He would mock them. He would give them false hope only to deny them. And his transcripts revealed a number of very concerning things, but the most concerning thing to me was that he consistently denied people parole for having exercised their constitutional right to go to trial 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so we sent these transcripts to Governor Cuomo's office in Albany with letters of no confidence, and four out of the five parole commissioners, including James Ferguson, were not reappointed. And as a result, the rate of release in New York has gone from 18% in the second half of 2017 to more than 40% every single month in 2018, with a high uh, this April of 49%. So to go from that, so so to go from 18% to essentially a coin flip to see people who had been in for 10, 11, 12. 12, 12 times the amount of time that they should have been in get out is a really encouraging thing that could not have been accomplished through traditional litigation alone. So these, these first two avenues are, are certainly important, but they, they don't get at something deeper. They don't get at something bigger. They don't help us understand why we have become the most punitive country in the entire world, why we continue to tolerate a system where poverty and race are the primary predictors of outcomes. And the reason for this is we haven't done a good job talking about our history. We haven't done a good job of talking about our origin story. And so I, wanted, I want to talk about that for a few minutes. We are living today in a post-genocide society. White settlers killed millions of native people through war, through disease, and famine, and justified that brutality by creating stories about those people, by saying they were dangerous, they were less intelligent, they were less, they were less human. And those same stories were told to justify the brutal and dehumanizing institution of enslavement. You couldn't be just, you couldn't be Christian and own other people without developing narratives and stories that said these people are less than human. And so as Professor Brian Stevenson often says, the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude, it was the creation of these narratives of racial difference. And so the 13th Amendment did nothing to, although it abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime, it didn't do anything to address those narratives. And so slavery didn't end in 1865, it simply evolved. It evolved into decades of convict leasing, of racial terror lynchings. Between 1877 and 1950, more than 4,400 African Americans were lynched in this country. And the narrative goes that they were, oh, they must have been, it was you know, the KKK doing it under the shadow of darkness. But the truth of the matter is, 
what we've documented at EJI was most of these lynchings took place by prominent members of the community, mm -hmm. by judges, by lawyers, by doctors, who created narratives about the people that they were per perpetrating violence against, saying they were guilty, they were dangerous, they were criminals. And so this narrative around black, black criminality solidifies. And uh, but during this period, more than six million African Americans fled from the South to cities in the North and the West, not only looking for economic opportunity, but as refugees from racial terrorism. And when they arrived in cities in the North and the West as refugees, they were confronted with additional violence, often at the hands of law enforcement. As the Civil Rights Congress wrote in a petition to the United Nations in 1951, the classic method of lynching used to be the rope, and now it is the policeman's bullet. And this is not a history or a story I ha had heard growing up. I, I had heard about the Civil War. I had heard about um, the Civil Rights Movement um, and a very over-celebratory version of the Civil Rights Movement that Professor Stevenson describes as a three-day carnival. On the first day, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus. On the second day, Dr. King marched on Washington. On the third day, Lyndon B. Johnson signed all these laws and racism was over. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about the, the systemic and organized oppression that people uh, marching for voting rights faced. We didn't talk about the fact that people were beaten by police, were arrested, were held in jail on bail amounts that they could not afford and were incarcerated. And so even as this wonderful civil rights legislation was being passed, the foundation for mass incarceration was being laid. And so at EJI, we have opened up a museum and a memorial to talk about this history, to connect the dots. And obviously not every public interest lawyer, every public interest law firm could you know, open up two large cultural spaces, but everybody who is doing this work I think has a responsibility to know this history, to share it, to be a community educator. Um, and I, I, I understand I'm almost out of time, but just quickly, something I've been thinking about, and I'd be very curious to get David's opinion on this, is you know, let's say you're a public defender and you have a suppression motion. Um, and it's, the basis for the suppression motion is a young black man was running away from the police, and that was deemed s suspicious. But what if in the, motion, in the suppression motion you talk about the fact that the police were the primary enforcers of the Fugitive Slave Act? What if, in the, what if you talk about in this motion the fact that police participated in hundreds of racial terror lynchings and that they were known as the foot soldiers of segregation? You may not gain relief for your client in his or her individual case, but you'll start reorienting judges, you'll start changing the consciousness in a fundamental way. And so I think in the era of Trump, what we need to do most of all is reconceptualize what it means to be a lawyer. Being a lawyer doesn't only mean knowing the law. Being a lawyer means being a student of history. It means being a truth teller. And sometimes it means taking a step back and letting the people most directly affected by the ordeal of incarceration tell their story, because they could change the narratives far better than any lawyer can. And if we do all of these things, I think that we could expand liberty and equality even in the age of Trump. Quick comment, then I'll, I'll take some questions. Um, uh, there are, um, you know, a lot of people out here working in criminal justice who built um, institutions now that build different narratives. Uh, Maddie Delone, the Innocence Project. Uh, when you think about the impact that the Innocence Movements had on, you know, on all the both repressive and and unfair measures in the criminal justice system, not only releasing hundreds of people, but um, but getting reforms as to uh, the reasons why they why they went there. And, and just as, a, as, a, as to answer your question about you know, trying to argue in a suppression motion that a, uh, particularly after Wardlow with the Supreme Court said, well, if you're young and you're black and you're running the high crime area, then it's common sense. You're up to no good, right? Um, and therefore, you can be stopped and frisked. Um, very recent decision out of the, what you're saying, that Massachusetts Supreme Court, a case called Commonwealth versus Warren, I think, where they said uh, same facts in the city of Boston. Uh, and uh, the lawyers built a record um, uh, about disproportionate stops of black use in Boston, and the Massachusetts Supreme Court suppressed the evidence under uh, Massachusetts law. So there are, there, there are, you know, there are ways of using that, but uh, all of which, let, let's start with the question here. Um, hi, Edwina Martin, class of 92. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, there has been massive um, backlash against the Robert, Robert F. Kennedy uh, human rights um, mass bailout action um, in uh, supposedly progressive liberal New York City. 
Um, I work in a city council office, and we had people calling our office, you know, afraid that dangerous criminals were going to be let out by this pl plan that supposedly was circumventing um, the law, quote unquote. So I wonder to what extent you've seen that in the work you're doing, and what are the um, responses that you're recommending people give to, to people when they call with these uh, surprising concerns. Hmm. Yeah, so I live and work in Montgomery, Alabama. And you know, I think what I've noticed is that there is a false dichotomy about the criminal justice systems in the North and the South. Um, that you know, in the North we have it all figured out as you alluded to, and in the South there, it's backwards and my cousin Vinny and things like that. Um, but what I've noticed is that they, um, they, they have maybe different idiosyncrasies, but this, there's the same flavor of injustice. And so um, I appreciate you saying that at the start of your question. I think the thing that you could say is that um, holding people in pretrial it violates the principle of presumption of innocence. And we've heard that a lot. We've had, you've had Justin, Justice Kavanaugh crying about it. And so I think given, given, that, given that the presumption of innocence is a bedrock principle, um, you know, I, I think that is a good place to start. I also think that, um, you know, being armed with statistics. In, in New York City, if you are held in, in a misdemeanor case, um, you are nine times more likely to plead guilty. And that's because you have a family to go home to, and a lot of times the prosecutors are saying, if you plead guilty to this case, you'll go home. And that's what Professor Stevenson is talking about when he says that wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. And so I think there is a way to frame it both in terms of a presumption of innocence and that no, no matter what you are accused of, uh, your financial resources and your poverty isn't, should not be the reason that you are disadvantaged. Judith, please. Hi. Much shorter than you. <laughs> Judith Fresnick, um, uh, 75. I just wanted to add to. There's a. Oh, okay, that's better. Hi. Um, I just wanted to add to your list of suggestions. Uh, Sia Senna. Oh, yeah. Is a, yeah. So I teach at Yale Law School and run a Lyman program, and she was a fellow there and is oh. now working with you. Um, that one of the questions is, is uh, in a world in which Trump is making everyone demons. Who are the people who we might think of as adversaries who might, as David was mentioning, be colleagues? And so one of the experiences, um, I know that there's a big lawsuit in Alabama against your prison system, but then the question is, if it's going to get fixed, it's got to get fixed in part because people won't be paid $22,000 to be prison staff, and the jobs have to get filled, and the prisons have to move out of rural areas. and how can one enlist? We found it very helpful to work with people who run prison systems and run other things in documenting, for example, solitary confinement. It's a joint endeavor. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to invite you to comment some about the ways in which your work has not only dislodged you from a north-south paradigm, but also um, had you find colleagues who you thought might have been adversaries. Hmm. It's, a, it's a good question. There's one example in particular um, that I'm thinking about. There was a guy who worked on Alabama's death row for uh, 40 years. His nickname was Bobcat. Um, he sort of moves like a Bobcat, and so that was the nickname he was given. And he recently yeah. retired, and he was on the execution squad. And so he, was, he participated in dozens, if not scores, of executions. And he recently retired, and it seems like he's had some sort of change of heart. He, um, he, I, he's, I think I've heard that he's having a very difficult time grappling with the fact he got to know these people, you know, the sort of power of proximity, people who are being cl who are close to this sort of violence and this sort of abuse, and have sort of a certain level of credibility because they're on the enforcement side. So I think there is certainly an opportunity, and you just have to identify those people. And I think you may get them uh, when they're sort of retiring. There's this scene from in, in, Into the Abyss about the death penalty where one of the, um, one of the people who was on the death squad there had recently retired and now is one of a vo vocal advocate opposed to the death penalty. So I think identifying that and figuring out when they're gonna retire. I think as a, <laughs> as a large term strategy, mm -hmm. understanding in this world that we inhabit, who are the ways in which we can talk with rather than against might figure out ways to change the contours of the thing we wanna make move. Yeah, I agree. 
and, and, and probably no more in, in, in the area of criminal justice when you think about the Koch brothers and ACLU, right? Um, uh, that strange relationship and uh, the right on crime, uh, conservative politicians who think we incarcerate too many people for too long, not for the same reasons we do, but you know, cost too much money and, and, and so on and so forth. There are these strange coalitions. Um, You've worked with wardens, you've worked with uh, prison commissioners, um, uh, you know, so that there, there are ways, I think, of breaking through some of these issues, uh, even in, in these tough times. Another, we'll take the time for one more question on criminal justice. We'll come back to some of this. If, any questions? Okay, if not, we'll thank Great. you. Great. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, Judy Rabinowitz, I asked her to send me a kind of a short bio, you know, to introduce her. I know her very well. I've worked with her many, many years. Uh, described herself as a, quote, reluctant lawyer. Um, uh, she entered law school in 1982, kind of as a slight diversion. She thought in her life from a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. Uh, here we are, uh, whatever it is, 25, 30 years later, we're <laughs> still a lawyer. Um, she got involved in immigrants' rights um, uh, in, in law school. Uh, and as you know, has been with the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project uh, uh, since 1988, uh, currently senior attorney. I mean, one of the, 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 the leading lights, right, in terms of the immigration fight uh, over the past uh, 35 years in this country. Um, argued the uh, uh, Denmore versus Kim uh, case in the Supreme Court, which was this, at that point and in this point, this important issue of mandatory uh, uh, immigration detention of immigrants uh, with criminal convictions, uh, lost that by a single vote, not surprising, um, uh, but continues to, uh, even though uh, this was this short-term diversion from uh, journalism <laughs> photography, continues uh, to, to, to not only to kind of, you know, try to protect what we have, but to try to think creatively about uh, uh, how, do we, uh, how, do we, how do we work in this, in this community. So, thank you, thank yeah. you, David. Um, first, I want to thank the Hayes Program for organizing this, and I also want to particularly thank Sylvia for being such a mentor and a friend for me over all these years. So, um, and then I wanted to say you're going to see the difference between being a recent um, Hayes Fellow and one from 30 years ago, because I don't have quite the same. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to have quite the same. I have a lot of passion. But I think in terms of, um, you know, optimism and hope, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of trying to, trying to, I mean, I liked the ideas that you were talking about, about changing the narrative. It just makes me feel like I need to go back to the documentary filmmaking and not litigation. <laughs> anyway, um, so I do want to give a brief overview of the kinds of issues that we're facing in immigration and that we've been doing at, at where I work at the ACLU, the Immigrants' Rights Project. But I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about the particular challenges that we face now. And I don't think that any of them are, aren't obvious, but I'm going to say them anyway. I mean, I've been doing this work for 30 years, and it's always been challenging. I mean, we've always been trying to both at the Immigrants' Rights Project to defend and expand the rights of immigrants, and expanding has always been the hard part. But, um, you know, but it's more challenging now. And it's, you know, it's not that the issues are different, the same issues, I mean, when I started working at the ACLU 30 years ago, the whole issue around Central American migrants trying to stop all the Central Americans from coming to the border, putting them in camps. Um, you know, there were a lot of other issues, immigration detention, things were the same. I mean, now immigration detention is on steroids. At that point, there were 6,000 people a day in immigration detention, now there's 44,000. Um, so it's not that things haven't gotten worse, but a lot of the issues are the same. What's particularly, though, more challenging now, um, I guess I'd say I'd put it, three or four things. One is that under Trump, I mean, it's been unrelenting, the attacks on immigrants. I mean, we've seen attacks on immigrants for the last, you know, 30 years, but it's been unrelenting, it's been more blatant, and more extreme, more extreme than anything we'd saw before. And, and even under Obama, it was bad. I mean, Obama had a reputation as the deporter in chief. I mean, under Clinton, it was awful. We got the worst law that we'd ever seen, the 1996, Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, or IRA, IRA. So things had been bad. It's not like I'm operating in some bubble of thinking that that we had it good before. Things were bad, but 
the level that Trump has been ready to go to. I mean, he was ready to adopt a policy and express policy of family separation that prior administrations had considered and said, we're not gonna go there. So there's not that sense of, we're not gonna go there. I mean, he's gonna go there. Mm -hmm. And now he's talking about sealing the border so that Central American asylum seekers can't come. So what we're seeing is just, it's just on a level of ugliness and extremity that's, that's worse than we've seen before. Secondly, you know, in doing this work, I mean, as being a litigator, we've always, at least I've always, and at the ACLU, you've always looked at, it was a part of a process of that you were also trying to, to get the administration or at Congress or, you know, you're trying to use the litigation as a pressure point. You didn't think that you were necessarily going to win in the courts, but it was going to be a pressure point. We don't have that pressure point. <laughs> I mean, the administration's not going to, is not vulnerable to any of this. They're not open to, to changing any of it. Congress isn't open to changing any of it. Yeah, you get a few people in Congress who are ready to write a letter and say this is bad. They're not going to be able to do anything. So, so we're left in this situation where you're, you know, like, okay, you'll, we'll see you in court, you know, but court has never been, I mean, it's, it's not the be all and end all. And that brings us to the next point, which it certainly isn't now. Um, we can win. We've had a lot of victories in lower courts, but we didn't win the Muslim ban in the Supreme Court. We lost it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't win immigration detention in the Supreme Court, either, either back when I argued Damore or more recently when the, mo the most recent reiteration of Damore Jennings came up, which was just saying, not that you, they can't deny you a bond hearing, and that was what I lost, which is the first time they said they could lock somebody up without a bond hearing. In Jennings, they said, we had finally, after 10 years of litigating, one, you know, built it up back to a place where it said, okay, but if they lock you up for six months, they have to give you a bond hearing. Oh, hala. You know, well, we lost that in the Supreme Court. I mean, thankfully, we only lost it um, on statutory grounds, and now we're back arguing on constitutional grounds. But once Kennedy left the court, you know, the thought that we're going to win that on constitutional grounds in this court, forget it. Our whole strategy has to be like, what the, you know, what the fuck do we think we're doing? You know, what are we doing? You know, if we win this, you know, we're not going to stop litigating, but if we win it, and we win it in the circuits which we want, you know, wh what are we setting ourselves up for? What's going to happen in the Supreme Court? So, so these, are, these are the things that we're facing in this particular challenge. I don't really have the answer to them. And then you're facing this politically toxic environment where, where I would say that you know, one of our goals right now is, you know, you know, when I say how do we keep doing what we do, how do we snatch hope from the jaws of despair in this context? You know, and one thing is you know, changing the narrative, winning, changing people's minds. But this environment is so politically toxic Things that I think should change people's minds. I mean, the Kavanaugh thing, you know, is like, you know, red meat to the Republicans. I mean, the fact that they're, that that um, that Trump is now talking about closing the border to, you know, to Central American asylum seekers, just what they need for the midterm elections. So, you know, so it's just. It's challenging because I do think that we do have to change people's minds. I do think we have to change the narrative, but I also don't have this sense that this is an issue that's necessarily so easy to change people's minds. And I think that there are openings, but, but I also think it's tough. So, you know, so ultimately I would say that for me, when I say how do I find you know, hope in the jaws of despair, what, what is it? It's the fight. It's that, you know, we got to keep fighting it, make it harder for them to do it, you know, slow them down. If they're going to close the border, they're going to have to go through, hopefully we can get a good district court judge who will stop them from doing it and we'll just, like with the Muslim ban, we'll just make them fight for it. And, you know, it's not with the solution that we're going to be able to win at the end. I'd like to think that we are, but, you know, meanwhile, we're going to fight. And I do think that there are opportunities in terms of, I mean, unfortunately we don't, most of this stuff is not stuff that we can go into the state courts to litigate because immigration is federal. Um, but there are things that states are doing 
you know, in terms of sanctuary policies, even in terms of saying they're not going to fund, you know, support immigration detention centers, they're going to put certain restraints on it. So there are things that states can do or states can set up pardon panels to try to make it so that people, it's easier to get pardons and they're not deportable. So I think that there's a lot of, I, I think we do need to, you know, be, you know, expanding our vision for this time and saying what are, what are other things that we can do. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. A few minutes. Sure. So let me just let me just give a, a little bit of an out of an overview of what are the is main issues. I mean, someone has already talked to you about the. I mean, people have talked about the Muslim travel ban. I, I guess I would describe the issues right now, the biggest issues, as the border, and I would tie that in with sort of the attack on asylum seekers. That's one big issue, which I'll try to touch on a little bit more. And the other is deportation and the other is detention, and those are both very linked. In terms of the border um, and the attack on asylum seekers, we've just seen it in all different directions, but essentially it's just Trump saying, we don't want these people here, and we're gonna keep them from coming, you know, we're gonna deter them from coming by locking them up, we're gonna deter them from coming from separating them from their families, we're gonna deter them from coming by sessions changing the asylum law and saying that people with gang and domestic violence claims can't even make out a credible claim to asylum, um, and now we're just going to seal the border. We're just going to we're just going to have an executive order like we did under the Muslim ban, it's supposed to be announced maybe as early as next week under this 212F. That it's not in the national interest to have people from Central America come in at the at the southern border. And I'd like to say that we're going to defeat that in the courts. You know, we'll try, but it's not going to be an easy, you know, legal argument. So. Um, but all of these things are aimed at just, you know, at, I mean, it's the biggest attack. I mean, there have been attacks on asylum seekers for a long time, but the idea that you essentially, they describe it, and this was described even under Obama and under Clinton as end the policy of catch and release, which I find so offensive, you know, that they talk about it as a policy of catch and release, as if, you know, we're talking about a game of catching animals and whatever, you know. Ending the policy of catch and release means lock up asylum seekers. That's what it means, and that's what they're doing. You know, people come here seeking asylum and they sit in detention for one year, two years, three years. That's what they have to do. They have to do that or they give up their case. You know, and now the plan is that they want to do that with families as well, and they're going to give you this binary choice. You either agree to be separated and have your children go off into you know, into an OR facility or foster care or whatever, or you have to be ready to sit there with them in detention for as long as your case takes. You know, year, two years, three years, whatever. So, so that's what we're seeing. Anyway, I realize I am going over time, so let me just say quickly on deportation, one of the biggest things that Trump changed, and this was one thing that, that Obama changed at the end of his administration only because of incredible pressure from, from advocacy groups, was that he adopted a policy of, of sort of enforcement priorities, where he said certain people aren't enforcement priorities, and people who've just been living here for a long time and are illegal aren't enforcement priorities. It still meant that there were a lot of enforcement priorities who shouldn't have been, a lot of people with minor criminal convictions, but there was a group of people who weren't looking behind themselves all the time thinking, when am I going to be arrested? Well, Trump got rid of it. He said, no more enforcement priorities. If you are here without authorization, we want you. And that's what the head of ICE, the acting head of ICE said. You should be worried. If you're here without documentation, you should be worried because we're going to get you. And that's what we see right now. People who've been here for years, who've been you know, living here, have US citizen spouses, children, jobs, I mean, whatever, have nothing, are like model citizens you know, in all different ways. They're just being picked up and deported. And I must say that it's just, I mean, on the level of having done this, this work for, you know, for 30 years, each time I see one of these cases, I just become so enraged. And, and it, it also ties into this idea of, you know, family separation was one of the, f the only thing that we got the administration to back off on. Not that he's stopped doing it, but it's at least to say, you know, we said, I'm going to do it, and then he said, no, I'm not going to do it, whatever. But family separation is happening every day. <laughs> We are deporting people every day and separating them from their families. 
And I don't know how to get that same level of visceral response, you know, to that, that this is what's going on and this is what we're doing. So anyway, let's <laughs> stay here for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Time for a question or two on immigration, if there are any. Hi. Yeah, please. I'm Ricky, Ricky Blum. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you with your journalist hat on, uh, okay. if you still have it. Um, how do we, uh, taking Adam's point about narratives, there are a lot of narratives here that are false and a lot of narratives that are, un, that are untold except maybe in the nation or you know, in the press that isn't hugely uh, available to people all over about why people come here and the U.S. role in why they come here, about how part of the goal here is not just to remove people or prevent them from coming in, but also to terrorize people so they're more subject to exploitation. And that that's not good for any workers in the United States. It's an anti-worker. It's sort of that Trump's lying about his caring about American workers and doing that and so forth. So uh, I remember hearing Bill Fletcher say that we can't address immigration successfully without talking about race and empire. Now, obviously, what Trump is doing is talking about race and empire in the wrong way. But then there's a vacuum <laughs> on the other side about in, in, in a need to talk about race and empire um, on our side. Uh, how do we do this effectively in the popular press or whatever? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm open to, you know, I mean, I think obviously we have to address race. I mean, I think that people are trying to, but an empire, you know, what role we play in the, in the world, but I don't know. I, don't I mean, it's like, like with Honduras, it's not complicated in the sense that it's very, you know, I mean, El Salvador it requires you to remember, you know, um, more than five minutes. Uh, I know, but it also but is like, who are we trying to, who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to persuade? <coughs> I mean, I, I think we have to talk about that. I mean, look, obviously immigration is about race and people's attitudes are, you know, and the policies are being generated by racists, but, um, mm -hmm. But I still feel like, I still feel like what, what maybe wins people over more is humanizing, is, is humanizing the whole thing. Not that you don't want to acknowledge that it's about race, but that, I mean, I feel like the, the few moments that I've felt a little bit hopeful is like when you, I would read stories about Trump supporters who then saw, you know, their, their person who ran their restaurant <laughs> being deported, and it was right. like, Wow, I didn't mean but he's them. like he's like <laughs> such a great guy. Or there's this one case that, that just broke my heart, where this Asian man is was being in in Maine was being deported because of an old drug conviction, and the whole local community, you know, you know, rallied against. He was married to a local Maine woman, had two two citizen kids, and his wife was pregnant. And the local newspaper, you know, wrote an editorial and said. What, you know, what's going on? No one gains by deporting someone who had this drug conviction. I mean, I guess what I liked about it was that it was, you know, it's one of those cases where they, it wasn't like this person who they said, this person has no crime, this person has, it was somebody who had a conviction. They said, so what? This person had this drug conviction eight years ago, 10 years ago, they've rebuilt their lives. What are we doing? We're destroying this family. We're not get, making ourselves any safer. So. That wasn't really about race or empire, but it was something that I felt like there was some yeah. level of saying, wait, this person's part of our community, and what are we doing here? This makes no sense. So that doesn't really answer your question, because I think we need to address all of it. Right. But it doesn't I end just, with the caravan. I guess it means going, having journalists going and interviewing people and telling their stories as yeah, they come and through. I don't, I don't and know. I don't, you know, I don't I'm know. not that optimistic that, yeah. you know, especially when, um, I forget who it was who meant, you know, asked the question about how do you get people who feel like their lives, that they've lost their jobs, they've lost their, you know, they have nothing, how do you get them to feel like their interests are combined with, you know, at, at one? Maybe you can get them to feel that way for immigrants that are here, but for immigrants who are coming from another country, yeah, do, they, do they feel like their interests are at one, or do they feel like, hey, you know, we don't have anything we don't want? So, I, I don't yeah. know. That's not very hopeful. One more question and then we'll move on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to steal my friend's question because she, she had a question too. So <laughs> it's a little joint question. But, um, so I, I uh, graduated in 2014 and now I work on Capitol Hill for the House Oversight Committee on the Democratic staff. Uh, crossing our fingers that we'll have a majority. 
Um, and this is obviously a huge issue for us, uh, and a lot of the things you're grappling with, we're grappling with too, like how can we do oversight of this immigration system and kind of promote legislation to address these problems that have been so long standing. Um, and I guess my question is, um, given the political divides that we're talking about and the lack of traction that um, social movements have had in promoting empathy for immigrants in rep you know, Republican-based communities, um, what are the, um, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve, that are achievable in the short term? Um, and what are the kind of facts that will be persuasive to achieve those goals? So kind of, I don't expect us to kind of turn Trump into Hillary Clinton in the next two years, but I do think that there, I hope that there are lower hanging fruit. And so what, if, if there are any in your mind, like what are the low hanging fruit and how can we get there? I don't know. I mean, I really, I really don't. Um, I mean, maybe DACA. You know, that's, that's just a guess. I mean, DACA being the you know, deferred action for childhood arrivals, just to say, you know, there was some, there had been at one point some bipartisan support for the Dreamers, and maybe there'd be a, a recognition that, okay, just let these people be. You know, you don't have to like. But. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I don't. I, I feel like there's a, also a divide between. I, I think that there. My impression was that there was a fair amount of support for comprehensive immigration reform, and for mm -hmm. at least as it's defined in terms of legalizing people's <laughs> status, the 11 million undocumented. But that doesn't mean that you'll ever see it, you know, become a law. You know, I don't know. So I don't know what it means in terms of facts winning people over and what it means to get votes in Congress. Or something. I mean, it's such a politically toxic issue that people are terrified of. So I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> hey, if uh, immigration is tough enough, uh, last talker on reproductive rights, uh, uh, we, we know is going to be uh, uh, equally uh, difficult. Katie Watson, uh, Hayes Fellow, 1992. Uh, uh, began a career practicing public interest law, has come back to it um, uh, as senior counsel to the Women's Reproductive Rights Project of the ACLU in Illinois. But her work really uh, for the past uh, uh, 20 years, um, she's now an associate professor of medical, social sciences, medical education, obstetrics, and gynecology um, at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, uh, she's been working in that area for all that time. She has published her first book this, um, uh, this year, I think, Scarlet A, The Ethics, Law, and Politics of Ordinary Abortion, which was described as, quote, revolutionary by the New York Times. Um, so uh, Katie um, uh, Watson and her views on uh, issues of reproductive freedom. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. When Margaret Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale, she departed from the conventions of dystopian f fiction. Instead of creating a world full of new gizmos, creatures, or language, every condition in her fictional police state of Gilead is drawn from something that's really occurred at some point in human history. I think that choice is what makes her reproductive horror story so chillingly conceivable. And it reminds us how essential understanding the past is to anticipating and shaping our future. So in my 10 minutes, I'd like to provide an incredibly brief historical refresher to everyone in this room who doesn't um, fall asleep and wake up thinking about abortion, um, as I do. Um, don't tell my husband. Um, and um, to tie each of, that bit, each of those bits of history to the fight to come. Um, it's also the case that my comments are billed as reproductive justice, and I want to um, acknowledge that for, for those of us who are my age and older in the room. So we grew up with fellowships in reproductive freedom, which is a negative right, right? The right to be left alone, the right to not have children. 
Those who came after us had the um, amazing insight, at, which has been articulated, of reproductive justice, the positive right to be assisted, to have or not have children, and when you have children, to keep those children and not have families destroyed, as Judy's explaining, through immigration and detention policies, through unjust foster care displacement. Um, and it's a vision that's grounded not just in constitutional rights, but in human rights. And it's a policy position that says, I need economic assistance. I need to be able to have a family. I need to be able to have safe neighborhoods. I need to be free of racism. Um, and so its, it's strength is the unified vision. Its weakness is that it's everything. And, and as lawyers, we can't do that in one lawsuit, or any lawsuits. Uh, Collectively, it centers on marginalized people. So we have to be careful by saying I'm talking about abortion, therefore I'm talking about reproductive justice. Not necessarily. On the other hand, I want to fight back and be clear how central abortion is to reproductive justice as a paradigm. Poor women have five times more unintended pregnancies than women with incomes above 200% of the poverty line. So issues of education and access um, are critical, and 49% of abortion patients have incomes below the poverty line. Another 26% are 1 to 200% of the poverty line, right? So abortion is absolutely an RJ uh, issue, and the RJ picture uh, just focusing on abortion is incomplete. However, because that's my area of expertise and because I think it's critical and it's so uniquely threatened in my limited time, that's where my comments will be focused. So, number one, 1973, Roe, we've all heard of that. Um, uh, it's misunderstood as giving every woman the right to an abortion. Actually, what it said was before viability, quote, the abortion decision in all its aspects is inherently and primarily a medical decision and basic responsibility for it must rest with the physician. Um, I think that that's important because it introduced what I could think of as the politics of sympathy versus the politics of entitlement, right? There's a mediating power, and this is Justice Blackman in that majority trying to ground it in the authority of the medical profession. And it's one of cases, the politics of sympathy, the medical case, right? But it hasn't produced the lasting cultural change we need to hang on to these rights and have them be um, integrated and taken for granted in a way that sustains the those wins. I want to make the observation, part of it's just organization, but reproductive rights and reproductive justice is on the liberty panel, not the equality panel. And that's a problem. I hope in a decade it will make more sense in the equality panel, because what's at stake is the personhood of women. Um, so let's, let's tie Roe to a recent case, uh, Garza versus Hargan, which when it went up to Supreme Court was Azar versus Garza. This is the case of the immigrant teenager, 17-year-old, who was detained, who arrived at the border eight weeks pregnant, wanted an abortion, was held hostage by ORR. There's just no other way to put it. Um, got a judicial bypass. Nope, not enough. And um, got a, was successful on Bonk in the DC circuit and then got the abortion, uh, I think the next day, and before it went, so it was moot in the Supreme Court. Relevant to this idea of Roe grounding it in the physician's power is that Brett Kavanaugh, in his dissent from that on Bonk DC circuit, used the term abortion on demand three times in a nine page dissent, saying Roe never provided abortion on demand, she should still have to have a sponsor um, assigned who she can talk to about her abortion, right, the parental figure. And that concept of abortion on demand, why that is still such a strong thing. So he can claim to be following precedent when he says Roe doesn't provide abortion on demand. Now, as was noted, I work in a medical school. I'm not for abortion on demand. That's rude. Um, I'm for abortion on request, which is what all medical care is given on the request of the patient. Uh, two, uh, the Medicaid cases, Maher versus Roe and Harris versus McRae, 77 and 1980. So we have the Hyde Amendment. We start chipping away at the, at the Roe right uh, the, as it is. Um, we're going to limit Medicaid funding. Um, 
the, what's terrifying about these cases is that they talk about how the state can make a value judgment favoring childbirth over abortion, and that the state doesn't have to remove obstacles of its own that are not of its own creation. So the idea that economics, the, the, the tragic language about that you know poverty is not a suspect class, and so therefore too bad if you can't get an abortion, even if your health is threatened, if your insurance is Medicaid, too bad. That's not what that right was. So this is a right for women of means, not for women without means. And that's an incredible right away winnowing of that right. And we don't teach those cases the way we ought to, I think, or enough. Let me tie it to a hopeful note. My home state of Illinois, um, in January this January passed HB 40, which uh, I think we're the 16th state, and about 10 of them, excuse me, are do this by court order. HB 40 changed our law and our Republican governor signed it to say notwithstanding any other provision of this code, the Medicaid uh, statute, the public aid statute, reproductive health care that is otherwise legal in Illinois shall be covered under the medical assistance program for persons who are otherwise eligible for medical assistance. Abortion is health care and we're not going to discriminate anymore. Isn't it interesting how all of men's medical conditions are covered by Medicaid and women's are not all of women's are abortion care, but will pay for childbirth. Not in Illinois, not anymore, no more insurance discrimination. So that's another route of legislative change to undo the harms of Harris versus McRae and say we're just state by state, we're not gonna do this anymore. Um, number three, Rust versus Sullivan in 1991, the, the, the first good domestic gag rule, says the First Amendment is not a violated when the government chooses to fund one activity to the exclusion of other, and this is Title 10 clinics, uh, the, the, the rule that your doctor can't mention abortion, can't make a referral, can't talk to you about that. We have an expert, uh, Rachel Pine, lit it was the lead litigator in that case, so I am not gonna talk about Rust, and I hope she will, but we currently have this administration, so everything old is new again, with the proposed, and, and they're gonna go through, and we don't have good, I hope we have good legal, um, to say to physical separation, right? And, and this is going to be devastating to poor women who rely on Title X for contraceptive care. Um, and what it says is poor women, those aren't real doctor-patient relationships, right? That doctors don't have this First Amendment right to talk to you about, like, actually do what is ethically required to tell you about all your alternatives and risks and benefits. Um, so we're back to that. Number four, Casey in 1992, um, I was in law school and I worked for the Center for Constitutional Rights. I made a tiny contribution to an, a, a brief talking about uh, how poor women have to travel. And as a naive law student, I was like, obviously this is an undue burden, even if they make that the standard. I mean, this is good. No? No? Okay. Um, so um, Casey opened the floodgates to the regulation that we're drowning under today. And it is a Jekyll and Hyde opinion that takes up the feminist equal protection argument and says this is about women as a group and economic equality and social equality, political equality, everything but citing equal protection, and then says, but we're going to have an undue burden standard. And nothing is an undue burden, practically, um, except for spousal notification in that case. And then from then on, we have just states limiting, limiting, limiting access. Um, in my book, I talk about the idea of structural stigma. This is a brand new idea, relatively new idea in sociology. So sociologists think about stigma as individualized, like someone says a gender-oriented epithet to me, and that's stigma on, based on my gender. Structural stigma is a broader picture that thinks about how law, institutional policy, and cultural norms take power and opportunity away from a stigmatized group, right? And what Casey allowed was all that was happening in the streets and on the sidewalks of clinics to be funneled through the legislature and put into the doctor's office, right? So instead of having clinic closures because people have chained themselves and delays, you have a 72 hour waiting period, like the law does it for them. Instead of the sidewalk counsel counseling, shoving pictures of fetuses in your face, you're forced to look at a sonogram on the doctor's table. Instead of the sidewalk counseling talk telling you fake uh, medical risks of abortion, your doctor has to read a script of fake medical risks of abortion, right? So Casey allowed that flood. Um, this summer there was a case called Nifla versus Becerra. Um, and again, we're back to this, the, the 
crisis pregnancy centers, so the, the, have a history from this sidewalk counseling. And what California did in response to concerns about patients being misled, passed a law that required unlicensed clinics that primarily serve pregnant women to notify women that they are not licensed to provide medical services, and licensed clinics in this category to notify women that the state provides free or low-cost contraception, prenatal care, and abortion services, just like you can get this stuff for free, did you know that, in California. Um, the Supreme Court ruled that that law likely violates crisis pregnancy centers' right to free speech. Now, this is the one case where you think Casey could work in your favor, because if the state can force physicians who provide abortions to read the state's informed decision-making speech, couldn't California force like unlicensed clinics that wear lab coats the way people behind the clinic counters do and like pretend to be sciency? And they're not a, they're not they're trying to make people believe that they're medical practitioners. Couldn't the state have the forced speech of simply having a sign that says this is what California provides? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, so this is the continuation of the abortion exceptionalism that Casey enshrined. Um, in Casey, Breyer uh, wholeheartedly joined in the court's decision, but in NIFLA, that inconsistency drove him to write the dissent to point out that this is an utter double standard. Um, yet the majority went with it, saying, well, it, the, this is a brief summary. They basically said abortion's different, which is the summary of all of the Supreme Court uh, uh, cases in this area. However, 2016, we get the next uh, bounce to Casey, um, Whole Woman's Health. And the beauty of Whole Woman's Health is it finally promised to put some teeth in Casey and said, okay, we have this undue burden standard, but implicit in that, and that is the argument we can talk about whether it's implicit or not, is we're gonna weigh it against the benefit. So if a burden is medium, but the benefit is nothing, it will out, you know, you don't get to have that regulation. So that um, in, in Whole Woman's Health, the issue was like applying, um, not like, it actually was, um, the issue was um, applying ambulatory surgery center standards to uh, clinics that provide abortion and the issue of admitting, requiring admitting privileges, which are hard to get and completely unnecessary. Um, and what was fantastic about the way the court rejected that was it implicitly rejected the structure, structural stigma as a legitimate governmental purpose in the area of abortion, right? It said, if you're gonna say this regulation is for women's health, okay, it actually ought to benefit women's health. And if it doesn't, you can't justify it with a lie. The problem was the record in that case is un. Believable. It's a gorgeous testament to the collaboration of social scientists and medical professionals working together to disprove this, but it's just so upsetting that a state can have no evidence that something will improve health and throw some legislative spaghetti to the wall, and those defending women have to invest untold amount of money in research in building this case. The shift that we will be dealing with in the, our community is the shift to um, fetal respect and the idea of respect for human life that, that Roe and Casey allow the legislature to express, and that's gonna be harder to beat with medical and social science um, data. That's, that's a different kind of values argument. So statutes that require the burial or cremation of the products of conception that's incredibly expensive and puts a little white cross in a lawn despite what the patient wants. Um, those kind of statutes for the state to express its respect. The other thing I want to mention is that I believe the Eighth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit, in case it's statutes that look very much like the Texas statute, have basically refused to follow Whole Woman's Health. And so I am so desperately worried about the rule of law. Like the idea in abortion, even when the Supreme Court writes a very strong and clear decision, just kidding, right? That the circuits don't have to follow it. This is, I wanna go back to Atwood for a moment uh, and the suspension of the Constitution that initiates the Republic of Gilead. And in this moment of pipe bombs, um, I, I'm worried about the judiciary. Um, it's also the case, I'm not gonna go into religion, 
the way I might like, um, but the ho connecting the Hobby Lobby case and the empowerment of Hobby Lobby with the current um, the idea of conscience and the idea that my religious liberty an expression of my religious liberty is my ability to control your reproductive life is an aspect of my religion, as controlling the reproductive lives of I, others. Um, I think of this as conscience as a club rather than a shield. And in the medical world, it's something we're grappling with mightily. And it's, a, it's something that's really had purchase. So I want to talk about this idea of, of what, what next and how do progressive litigators and activists in this area work. Well, um, at the same time that we passed HB 40 with the Medicaid coverage in Illinois, we flipped our trigger law. It, it had said if Roe ever is overturned, um, abortion is illegal in Illinois. And what it says now is, is if Roe was ever overturned, the standard in Illinois is the Roe standard. So the next morning, women in Illinois wake up fine. Um, if you're into state court legislation, uh, state court litigation, you should sleep with the uh, Iowa Supreme Court's opinion in Planned Parenthood versus Rendell's under your pillow. Um, they, in the June of this summer, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled with their um, due process clause that looks, I think, almost identical to the federal due process clause, said, quote, autonomy and dominion over one's body go to the very heart of what it means to be free. At stake in this case is the right to shape for oneself without unwarranted governmental intrusion one owns identity, destiny, and place in the world. Nothing could be more fundamental to the notion of liberty. Therefore, they could have just been pulling from Sylvia's article um, that Iowa women have a state constitutional right to abortion. This was in a case in which the Iowa legislature had um, passed a 72-hour waiting period. And in the challenge of that, the Iowa Supreme Court was like, P.S., you have a constitutional right to abortion, and we're not going to use the undue burden standard, because fundamental rights get strict scrutiny. We're not going to fool around in Iowa. Um, that happened in Kentucky, and then it got rolled back by the electorate of Kentucky that amended the Kentucky Constitution. Most people don't remember, Kentucky Supreme Court had their moment. Um, it got rolled back, and now Kentucky has one clinic in Louisville that's this close to being shut down. So it does, might not last, but in terms of state court uh, litigation, that is inspiring. What this means in a, in a world where Roe is gutted is that we will have islands, um, and so Illinois is one of those. And the right to travel is suddenly going to be a hot, hot area of constitutional law. So any of you who are students looking for a note topic, please write about the right to travel. Missouri has a law right now that uh, opens people to criminal penalty if they assist a minor cross state lines to uh, get an abortion. Missouri's a consent state, Illinois is a notification state. We have a lot of young women coming across and we have to tell them, you have to tell your sister who's driving you, she could be open to criminal san or, you know, civil sanction from your parents if they find out and they disagree. I'm concerned that states that want to lock down their population are going to have similar laws. This is a crazy idea, but the clampdown on telemedicine, I'm interested whether telemedicine could become defended um, across state lines as part of the right to travel. We travel virtually now. And what would that look like if the states that are banning telemedicine and work across state lines? Um, the last thing I'll say <laughs> is that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And that always bums me out a little. Not because I've had breast cancer, not because I don't want that disease to be addressed. But there's a table at my son's school with lots of pink stuff. When I flew here, there was an in-flight video of United employees with pretty pink lipstick and scarves and their names saying, you know, this person is a survivor and help them. And it's great. But it also makes me sad because the number of American women who have an abortion every year is five times the number diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And yet there will never be a fun run for abortion. 19% um, of all American pregnancies end in abortion. If you only consider unintended pregnancies, that number is 42%. And so what we've dealt with for the last 45 years is something researchers call the prevalence paradox. How can something be common, so common be so stigmatized still? And so I think that the, it's the culture change that we need in this area. People both coming out of the closet, understanding that it's about women's personhood, understanding the concept of how many of us uh, men, women, families benefit from abortion. 
Um, the Handmaid's Tale ends not just with Offred's escape, but with a conference of historians looking back on the end of the regime of Gilead. And I think our challenge in this room is to write the story of the, Hayes, the 70th Hayes reunion, the 80th Hayes reunion. What is the story we will tell there about how we escaped by the skin of our teeth um, the insane person in chief and all his followers from restricting women's lives in the way everyone in this room fears? Thank you. I think we're going to end it there. I'm not going to stand between people and the, yeah, uh, and the, uh, the, and the room over there. It's an amazing, uh, amazing performance by everybody on this panel. And it, it just reminded me of one of the last thing I want to say. Um, when I talked about the Hayes program and, and comparing it uh, to all my other colleagues and friends and supporters and, 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 and clients. And, and, I know you don't want to stand between people and their food, but some people might have questions for Katie. Yeah, so what I suggest is we, we go over and, 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 and you talk to her, okay? Because I think we're running over, I think we're now at, uh, we're, we're about 15 minutes past the thing. But, um, so, but let me just say one, one, one last thing about, about the program. The other thing that the Hayes program has really done um, has created a movement in law schools like similar programs. Liz Schneider runs the Sparrow program in, in Brooklyn. We've got the Lineman program at Yale. Uh, Penn has got the Toll Public Interest Center. The success of this program, the work that people have done, not only in law school and, and, and clinics and so on, has been kind of an inspiration for public interest programs across the uh, country uh, in terms not only of, of, of you know, undergraduate work and then fellowships uh, uh, beyond that. So uh, the more we do, the better we work together, uh, the broader the benefits. Uh, you're right, I wish we had more time, but Katie will be here and you'll be able to ask some questions. Well, people who want to eat can, but for those who want to hear it, ask a question. <laughs> Everyone else was able to, you know. No, please, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. I'm saying I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, thank you. I, I just want her to have the same opportunity. Okay, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, thank you. <laughs> no, no, I no, no, no that, that's fine, Definitely. please. Thanks so much, and thanks for your work. My name is Gabrielle Prisco from the class of 2003, and thank you, all of you, really profound and beautiful work. I heard a common thread, which was about cultural and narrative change, mm -hmm. and about, um, I run an organization that brings mindfulness to kids who are incarcerated and homeless and suspended from school, and one of the things we've been thinking about a lot is mindful public policy, and about how to bring values of love and compassion and mercy and just justice to the forefront, kind of like how there's a Hippocratic Oath, first do mm -hmm. no harm, like what's the equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath for the law? So the question that I have for you is that particularly in the reproductive justice space and in the abortion space, what do you see as the effective tools for culture change and for um, particularly occupying the space in the medical school and the legal field for kind of not doing harm to women and, and having our cultural conversation focus on that? Um, I will s just say one sentence, which is the idea of, I don't want any more Jane Doe plaintiffs um, the idea that we all work anonymously, that patients are always anonymous. Mm. We need patients to step up. The uh, doctors can no longer be the, fa the so exclusive face of the right. I've learned that people are interested in talking about abortion rights. They're not very interested in talking about abortion care. Mm. And that's why I've moved to the medical space, because to me it's all about abortion care. So how do you maximize whatever legal access you have? We're not maximizing all the access that we actually do have, and that needs to happen in the medical space, the patient space, and the local space. So I th think putting faces on this and having people talk about their experiences, which is happening more and more, is, is one piece of that. I want to add to that answer. Mm -hmm. Read Katie's book. <laughs> <laughs> Katie has written a wonderful book, and you have handouts of thank you. How people, oh, you can find yeah. it on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, the Scarlet A. It's a deep. It's a funny book about abortion. <laughs> <laughs> but it has. My the intention was turn. to write a book club book because to how do people start having a yeah, conversation? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Sylvia. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Katie, please? My son is going to ask a question. <laughs> um. <laughs> I just, I just want—I say that because I sat down, I introduced myself, and the first thing this 
brilliant young man said to me, he goes, oh, 92, that's the year I was born. And I said, well, that's, that's funny. I mu- uh, maybe I'm your mother. So, <laughs> yeah. I was, so in, t- <laughs> in terms of like um, increasing, like, ac- like, I don't know, like some sort of like medical, right? I'm thinking like, how do you think like we can have, I guess like, I'm thinking of like how to fit like like a trans person's like right to make a family, yeah. a trans woman's right to be a mother, mm-hmm. um, and like a trans person's right to you know get the medicine and um, yeah. medical stuff that they need. Like, what do you, what would you think that right would be named? Like, do you think there could be like a right to exist? Or like a right. I, I believe that there is one, um, but I, I do think just in terms of reproductive rights generally, I don't think we need a special new name. I, we have to be mindful, but in terms of the reproductive justice framework, it's also about the expression of sexuality and reproduction and, and identity. So, for example, I'm on the board of uh, directors of a group called NAF, which organizes, which uh, represents all the independent or is the uh, organization of dependent independent abortion providers, and I've drafted an ethics statement that's like their ethics mission, and we've been very careful to use inclusive language of persons capable of pregnancy because we recognize that not every person personal, person capable of pregnancy identifies as a woman, and that providers are trying to be very um, sensitive to that. And Planned Parenthood providers are, uh, some of them getting into trans care, um, seeing that as a natural spectrum of uh, their expertise in hormones, some of them, and developing new expertise. So creating inclusive spaces is key to this. And I want to call out Lynn Paltrow's work in terms of advocates for pregnant women as, as like one of the Ur reproductive justice organizations. This is about the right to have children. If the women she represents had abortions, hey, they wouldn't be being prosecuted, right? The idea is, well, some of them still would be because they're self-inducing, but uh, the Uh, The idea that that their crime is being pregnant and wanting to have a child and then having some other things happen. Um, So in terms of reproductive justice, finding that space and understanding the connections that that when one goes down, the rest do too. I've been spending time talking about people in assisted reproductive technology um, about why do you think you're safe and why aren't you standing up over here, that it all needs to be connected. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue the conversation.